All right, welcome everybody. We're going to try something new. Do a video recording in the live trade room. It seems it might be uh, it's a unique situation, so you guys can catch it in the live trade room. And then we'll also post it on the website under the members section so people can have an opportunity to review this later. So uh, this week is my vacation week. I will be out of the office. The trade rooms will be up. We will have people here to make sure there's backup that things, if something goes wrong, it'll be up and available. Uh, I will be monitoring the markets from a distance and positions. Never do I go on a vacation without some kind of connectivity to the real world. It's just impossible. Um, so if you're at the office, uh, we will try to respond by emails if there's emergencies and other uh, aspects as well. So just to let you know, we're not completely ditching the world and turning everything dark, but uh, we are taking a much needed break before things get even crazier in earnings season. So this is a perfect week, I would imagine, uh, if you had to pick a week that could possibly see some decline in volatility, this would be the calm before maybe the other storm, uh, which would be, again, earnings season brewing and uh, the anticipation of the next FOMC meeting and the debate that rages. Is the Fed going <laughs> to, it, it's just, it's beyond the comprehension of why uh, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve have just been so far behind the eight ball on uh, curtailing inflation and, and with such a strong economy and, and housing that was built in the in the pandemic and um, just just all the fiscal stimulus of all the uh, money that was thrown in, in the economy on a global scale. Uh, now we're in a, 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 a pretty good pickle, I'd have to say. So with that said, what are the what are the technical tea leaves read? Uh, it's a very confusing time. Uh, we have at the top of your screen would be the daily charts on the bottom are weekly. So I'm going to get through this kind of top down bottom approach, uh, top bottom approach first, and we'll, we'll just uh, breeze right through this. So in the newsletter, I said the, the volume, the weekly volume has improved. The weekly volume improved. The weekly volume in the Russell did not improve. And the Russell is the one that kind of did OK last week. Um, the volume did not improve in the Dow. The diamonds had a daily PPS sell as well as a low close doji. So over the next eight to 10 trading sessions, it pr it um, provides a one to one risk reward ratio of a move back to around 440, 341 ish. I 342 is the actual target. So um, on on Friday, we opened higher, traded lower, came back and formed another doji. So we have indecision on top of uh, a market that's uh, overbought and yet on a daily basis the advanced decline is positive still so what what does positive mean it means it crossed the moving average it held support of a rising moving average trend in the advanced decline but when you look at the weekly analysis it was fairly neutral no volume seasonal trend goes up it's a hard one to read now let's take a look at what the pivot analysis suggests so up here we're using weekly pivots we have a mild bullish blue above gold which then forecast a higher red and a higher green. So it's, we're getting a weekly pivot analysis of a, a, a possible rally next week. Uh, the same exists for the Qs, the same exists for the Russell, and unfortunately the same exists blue above gold for the Dow. Why do I say, am I hesitant with that? Because uh, we did recommend in the live trading room a diamond bear put spread that would expire on April 8th. So. With normally a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio, it's easy to uh, see or meet that objective. And besides, on the 348 strikes for the weekly A to A uh, options, there is huge amount of volume uh, relative to the Dow or diamonds in this case. When we take a look at the New York Stock Exchange NYSE, blue above gold. So technically, we have another uh, you know, mild bullish weekly pivot outlook there. So... This week was kind of important. It was the end of the quarter. It was the end of the quarter when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates and have announced a uh, the end or the era has ended of quantitative easing. And so the market kind of shrugged it off. And then we had one of the strongest unemployment reports 
We're back to 3.6% on a headline number. Revision after revision after revision. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, government workers, somehow cannot figure out how to work a calculator. And what do I mean by that? Private payroll company, ADP. If you own a small company, three, four, 500 employees, you call ADP and say, hey, we hired a, new, a bunch of guys uh, in, on the uh, assembly line. We had new uh, office workers. Here's their salary. Uh, I need you guys to figure out their payroll. And, and that's what ADP does. ADP takes all that information around the world of their clients around the U.S. and says, hey, we're putting out a private forecast and here's what we see. They have been dead right for almost two years, but get completely dissed when the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the government worker reports come out, which is what the Federal Reserve FOMC voting members kind of rely on and use because it combines both private and government payrolls. Generally, we don't see the government um, decrease or fire people, right? So we, we see a growing uh, control in, in uh, maybe unions and teachers and, and, and city workers, et cetera, et cetera, on a local level. But federal, federal employees generally, unless there's the sequestration, if you remember that word, where we close the parks uh, and we lay people off. And those people actually got paid anyway on, on um, uh, uh, when, when Congress passed the, uh, the budget. So the, what's the point I'm trying to make? To sum this really up is that we have had an increasing job growth. ADP has been right. And what happens is the BLS comes out and with the headline number, oh, there's only 455,000 jobs created. But, oh, yeah, we forgot. We revised January already in last month. And then we're revising it again upwards because we were wrong twice now. So there was another revision uh, in the December, or the January and the February numbers now. So that's how the, the headline number went from 3.7 to 3.6 because of these revisions. And it doesn't get a lot of headline news. Another thing that got didn't get a lot of headline news uh, besides the ADP report was that average hourly uh, wages increased four tenths. That's wage cost impression for decades and decades from Alan Greenspan all the way up to Ben Bernanke to the current Jay Powell, the Fed has always said uh, food and energy is, you know, temporary, but wage cost pressures, uh, that's what really causes inflation. Now they kind of don't really look at it that way. So we are artificially being supported in the market. And I think the big worry is the Fed needs to raise rates. They don't want to raise rates. It would make the current administration look bad because if you over tighten then you uh put a constraint on credit conditions people can't get loans rates go up housing has been going down because as 30-year mortgages go up if you will qualify for a 400,000 mortgage at uh at a three percent 30-year fixed and then the 30-year fix goes to four and a quarter that one and a quarter percent increase might price you out of your monthly payment per your annual salary. So then you won't qualify to get the mortgage for that house, or you have to put up more cash to pay the difference. So this is a big issue in our uh, economy. We noted this week that transportations, you look at Friday rails, I'm not sure what who hit the, the sell button on the rails, but some of the, the rail companies, CNI, uh, Canadian National, CSX, fell five and six percent in a day that's pretty heavy for a rail company anyway here's what i take a look at from a seasonal perspective we do get a dead cat bounce in the month of april however the seasonality uh generally from february through april 1st in like a lion out like a lamb and the stock market did not go in like a lion and, and out like a lamb it went in like a lamb and out like a lion so we had a major uh recovery I think the market could go back up, possibly testing this level lying in the sand in the S&Ps. We could possibly see a recovery in the SPY to 470-ish. Retest last week's high, get back up where the moving average crossover is and that old pivot that's between 466. Sometimes the market overshoots the runway, double top us out, and then Katie, bar the door, look for another downside slice. That's not improbable. Um, we did get a high closed doji on the SPY. The one-to-one -one risk reward ratio is pretty much the range 
of what that that move was. There was the doji. Here was the high closed doji. And if we extend that up, by the way, a one to one risk reward ratio on the uh, the that movement over the next eight weeks. Gee, what a coincidence! Four seventy two. So temporary, I could see upside. What would get us there? It would have to be technology. It would have to be MSFT. Excuse me. We'll take a look at Microsoft. So um, if we take a look at Microsoft, it's in a monthly sell. Oh, my goodness. It's in a monthly low close doji. So we could still see maybe a short term pop. It doesn't go down. It doesn't go up much, but it helps support the market. G-O-O-G. There's another one. Google. All the high mega cap stocks. Uh, A-A-P-L. Look at Apple. Uh, these are the mega caps staying up near its highs, not falling down. So if we get a recovery in other spec sectors, if we take a look at IBB, biotech, uh, biotech's gotten smashed, but it seems to be with a mild uptick and seasonality. It has a pretty strong time period this time of year. So um, we have XLU, and this is what I was reporting to you in the newsletter, a breakout in the utilities. Utilities is a defensive play. So energy is pretty, uh, and the only problem I have with saying, hey, gee, let's now get into Ener uh, XLU, um, there's no volume. I mean, there's no new positions. It's, 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 uh, it's vulnerable for a correction. So look at the volume here. Look at the new high breakout on weak volume. And to me that, uh, you know, maybe we got a little bit more upside, but I, I, I don't know how to chase something on no volume uh, from a historic standpoint. We are in a new era of the markets. It seems everybody, um, you know, money is flowing around and we're going to have competing um, spaces for dollars now, which would be uh, interest rate returns. And so where we haven't had that. And if you get a Fed funds rate in one to one and a half percent target, which is what the Fed funds futures is, is suggesting a 90 percent probability. That's where we'll be by June. I mean, how do you go from zero interest rate and the Fed buying assets every month, pouring liquidity into the market to no more buying of assets and raising interest rates with a snap of a finger? Is the market prepared for that? So, you know, here's a, a, a chart on the real estate investment trusts. Why is this going up? Well, certain REITs are and certain REITs aren't. And we got to make sure that if you're looking at REITs, you want to read that owns real estate assets, not someone like Weyerhaeuser, who's a paper company who files as a real estate investment trust, which gets taxation uh, relief. So a real REIT and a, a mall like a SPG, a Simon Property Group, uh, this is Simon Property Group, two different things. If, if people are going to see higher costs on their credit, um, you know, this this is a big kind of conundrum and a, and, a, and a major cross current of what's affecting the market. So from a top down approach in the marketplace, we have a, uh, a an interesting dilemma. We formed a doji on a weekly basis on the spy, which is indecision. We got John person saying, hey, the pivots are projecting upside. We could see, uh, uh, you know, the market by next week. And I have a rule, it's called the first five or 20% of the time frame. It doesn't work 100% like nothing does. But one thing's uh, uh, unusual about this, in a strong uptrending market, we generally get the pivot, that's the blue line, acts as support. Like you can see it, back test it yourself throughout history. It's worked for decades. That's why the person's pivot is a very powerful forecasting tool. Next. We also see with candlesticks, what makes candles green? The market closes greater than the open. So generally speaking, generally 67% of the time, after the first 20% of a time frame passes, so let's look at a month. What's 20% of the full month? 20% of the month, let's say four weeks, 20 days. That's first four, I give it five days. If the first five days of the month, the month opens, trades lower, and after the first five days of the month, we're back above the monthly open. We have a 67% probability the low for the month is in. If that combined with the, the after the first five trading days, the market's above its monthly pivot, you have a good strong probability, 
higher odds that the low is in for the month and and that we would see either stabilization in price or slightly higher in price and then we would get a close greater than open so the, what we have to watch for is a a close in the first five days below the open and we also have to watch for a weekly close below the monthly pivot if that's the case then this signal trumps everything this is a pps monthly sell and it exists in all the top indices qqq so if you say hey person there's the q a monthly low close doji in the q okay uh and we're still below falling ma's over a period of time so if someone says well why are you bearish the market long term there's my the the first reason here's the quarterly an equal and opposite on a quarterly basis so we could pop on a quarterly basis and form a trading range like we did over here in 2000 when market broke out equal and opposite next month rose and fell and three months later bang 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 that might be what we're setting up for so when i say longer term i'm bearish i am but that doesn't mean we can't get a small rally relative to the overall high back up to possibly 370 in the spider get everyone hunky dory the market's great so that's what I wanted to say. So in the near term, we could still see some upside. Let's take a look. So that's that's one thing I wanted to point out to you. Let's take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the diamonds. Very similar on the quarterly chart. Let's take a look at a monthly chart. Oh, yeah, it's also in a sell mode. This looks more like a distribution rounding top pattern than it does a rounding bottom. So the moral of the story is look at the moving averages. And that's what averages do. They they smooth out prices. The, the average was flat and now it's detrending. So until that actually and prices, both the high, the low, the open, the close is all below the moving average. On what planet do you get bullish and say, gee, this looks exciting. It's at the very least, you might say maybe there's some stocks that might go up, but you also want to point out that on a higher time frame, this is something not to ignore. That's my two cents. So we have um, a lot of different things we look at. Most traders, most technicians, most people in this world really don't pay attention to the higher time frame trends. They, you, you see them on TV. Look at the daily trend. It's up. And, and, and they barely look at, at weekly charts, let alone why would someone look at a monthly chart? And the monthly, as I was taught, in 1980 by none other than George Lane himself, who was the creator and the grandfather and the inventor of the stochastics indicator. George said, always start left and work right. You start with your monthly, your weekly, your daily, and your 60 minutes. And I swear to God, that's exactly how he talked. God bless George Lane and his wife, Carrie. And um, so with that said, fond memories, we had at the end of the day last week, uh, let's put the uh, chart back to SPY, uh, we had a daily sell signal, low closed doji in the SPY. Uh, we did not generate a daily sell signal in the Qs. We did in the in the Russell. We did in the Diamonds, and we did in the NYSE. So on a weekly basis, what I wanted to point out to you, we're a little overbought up here in the McClellan Oscillator on the NYSE. We have long shadows, which is why we're looking at the green. Uh, boxes plus here's the confusing monthly sell weekly was in a buy with weekly dojis i mean it shows that the market had a lot of indecision last week so last week was a weird week it was the end of the quarter which ended on thursday it was the end of the month which ended on thursday and the week ended on friday friday was a weird day opened higher traded lower and then in the last 15 minutes, we got about a 20 handle rally in the S&P 500. Very strange. That's two weeks in a row, by the way. We've seen a Friday where the main trend from the open to mid uh, afternoon is down. And then it rallies sharply in the last, say, 15 minutes of the day. Two weeks in a row. And that's unusual. So I don't know if it has anything to do with quarterly window dressing or the end of the quarter. But it is an anomaly that, that I, I wanted to point out. So uh, where's the market going? You can't ignore the fundamentals and you can't ignore another chart. And I'm going to share that with you right now. So let's get into my main seasonal page. 
And uh, basically, I'm going to change that right now. Do you want to? Well, no, we don't need to save that. Sorry about that chatter behind the scenes. All right. So let's take a look at uh, first thing in the newsletter. I was talking about what looked good this week. We had uh, from a monthly perspective, uh, two things improved uh, oversold on a monthly basis. Stochastics is the IBB. Um, also XLV, which is the healthcare ETF that seems to be doing fairly decent. And, uh, when we take a look at the drug stocks, this, this could be a very, um, uh, let's call it volatility. Would you, would you agree with that? I mean, it rallies, it pukes, it rallies, it pukes just as hard. It rallies and let's see what happens. But over time, High volatility marks tops and bottoms of the market. This is the healthcare sector ETF. A lot of that had to do with PFE, Moderna, et cetera, et cetera. One stock that we have a position in, uh, as I get from our top-down approach, is Johnson & Johnson. Take a look at this chart. Mo uh, month opened, and we closed greater than the month so far one day. If in the next five days we're still above the monthly open, the prognosis is that we go a little bit higher. How much higher? possibly 183, the weekly pivot resistance up there. And so um, let's take a look. That's weekly pivot. So this is a daily chart with weekly pivot blue above gold. So Johnson & Johnson, we cut half the trade. We have an April 14th expiration. If we do see some nice follow through upside, keep your orders working at the two bucks that I said to do in the email alert, those orders should still be working. I didn't cut the trade. I was thinking, well, let's see where it goes. It fell right back to MA. Um, on Friday, it was still, you know, trading above the weekly open. Uh, you know, it just got, a, it, it closed greater than uh, old high. Here's the old tweezer top high. Two weeks in a row, we have closes above an old resistance. Volume was up and broke out. How the heck do you not want to have participation? It's been a slow bleed upside move. We hardly paid anything for a five wide spread, five wide meaning long 180, short 185. Um, we barely made a little money, 35 cents on a dollar 10 purchase. So we bought at 110, sold at 145. And we're trying to make a little bit more money on the back half of the, the strategy. That's Johnson & Johnson. I share this with you because some drug companies are doing well and the biotech sector seems to be getting a little bit of, I guess, positivity. It's one of the very few sectors that really performed well last week and that's why we have to address it, all right? When I look at the weekly volume, I go, wow, there, there's not a lot of buying in there. And when I look at this daily chart, I go, all right, looks like maybe a little bit of bottoming action, but I mean, this could be a base that could last another month. I mean, this could come all the way back down because there's no real volume ahead of this trade. So I would have to say if it does break out and respect the outlook of weekly pivot, which is blue above gold, we got a 137. So day traders, as long as you're, and, and swing traders, as long as we're above the weekly pivot this week on a daily basis, um, take a look at LABU for short-term trades. So Labu generated a daily buy. It generated a weekly buy. And that's thus the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention. So if if it's truly bullish, short-term traders will migrate to the leveraged ETF. And the volume trend was, I guess you want to call it okay. It's above its MA. The MA is the red dash dot. So you can look at self-directed traders and you guys in the live trading room. Take a look at LABU for... Um, a, a short-term pop to possibly, I don't know, 20 to 22, right? So maybe it, it accelerates to the upside and surprises us and gets up to the, uh, again, the monthly pivot, which is maybe 23 and a half in those moving averages. We'll see what happens, right? So I wanted to, to lay that on you. ITB, let's take a look at the uh, home construction sector. This looks like a massive top that broke its uh, main trend. And when I say it broke its main trend, if you wanted to just draw a simple trend line, here's what's really nasty about this. Um, it trend near support, pullback near old low, pullback held, 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 failed, broke down, came back. And what was old support of that swing trend line is now had acted as resistance. I don't like that. Volume did not fall through on the week, on the day. Volume on the week fell. 
and uh, we are nowhere in a strong seasonal pattern here. So how much lower could housing go? And that would include PHM, Pulte Home Group. That would include Toll Brothers. Uh, maybe we get a dead cat bounce here, but this is a very negative higher time frame pattern. Quarterly pivots. This is a monthly chart with quarterly pivots. Persons quarterly pivots, blue below gold. Negative outlook on a quarterly basis. We do this because it's, well, it's a new quarter. And then the monthly chart, this is monthly pivots, blue below gold. Monthly is giving a downside. And then weekly pivots, blue below gold. So uh, I can't really get excited about a, a, a sector that would lead the U.S. economy higher when housing is falling apart. Let's take a look at transportation, IYT. I did bring this to your attention in the newsletter. That's a nasty ass sell off on a daily basis, right? From 270 to 259. Um, most of it came from truckers and rail companies. With crude oil and the Biden administration uh, doing a release of SPRs, uh, a million barrel a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, it's not going to really hit the market until maybe late April. Uh, first off, they got to get it out of the caverns. They got to load it up on trucks. You would think rails would do pretty well and truckers would do pretty well because they got to go from the caverns in a barrel where it's stored uh, in salt mines in Arkansas, Louisiana and other places and they're strategically located. Um, I don't have access and didn't get the email of the ex precise uh, place they're stored, but it's supposed to be a secret. Um, but most people know where they are. But anyway, the long and short of it is you got to get those barrels of just natural raw crude oil, get it to a refiner. The refiner makes a contract with the U.S. government, says, hey, if you give it to us at this price, we'll replace it later because we, we we that's what we do, suck oil out of the ground. They have guaranteed income and they're refining it, refining it, and they put it on the market as a refined product. Problem is, this is the summer blend gasoline. So no matter which way you slice or dice it, gas is not going down to the pump. It's going to stay stable or slightly lower, but it ain't going to be like $3 gasoline at the pump or $2.50 again, not by a long shot. So transportation might be a reason why it didn't do well after the announcement. I, I didn't get my fingers on this one or hands wrapped around it entirely, but CSX is um, a rail company. And I just wanted to say, while it did not generate a weekly sell signal, the um, the volume action over time is probably one of the most um, divergent pattern I've seen on anything in quite some time. So lastly, if we change um, platforms here, and I want to share with you this chart, this is again HG, um, H, excuse me, HGSI. Uh, with our indicators, and I wanted to share the PMC readings with you. So first off, this is Johnson & Johnson. Relative strength, looking bueno, volume awesome. Stay with your half position, and also as well, uh, make sure you have your offers up there at two bucks. All right, next, let's take a look at I, um, YT, the transport sector ETF. Um, as the higher it went and made a new high, it made a... Uh, strong i mean this is this is bearish this is a weekly chart friends not an even a daily monthly chart ah uh, you know it's just very consolidated and it's uh, breaking down so something's going on in transportation so dow theorist if you have your um if the dow and then you get transportation uh you know that's part of like if you make a widget and you can't transport it it's a problem there's two companies big ones car companies ford they're going to shut a plant down why can't get parts also, GM, they said, oh, we're going to shut a plant down. We can't get parts. You know, when everyone was hell bent and guys on TV and the big guy that uh, calls up uh, people on his show and CEOs and says, you got to get in. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. We did miss the trade in Ford. I did miss the trade in General Motors. I did not put in the newsletter at one point ever time. I mean, we had enough problems with Walgreens, but I didn't, I didn't want to buy this because, look, Every time it rallied, it sold off, but every time it, it had this, like what I would call a distribution top, rounding top, volume matched and mirrored a negative outlook. So did the PMC. So that's GM. When the volume starts to make a rounding bottom and the uh, relative strength starts to improve, then we'll take a look at, then will be a better time to buy this. AMD, in the live trade room, AMD made a bearish engulfing pattern 
and once again, same story here, just different stock. Relative strength, newer highs, can't get past old highs. Something didn't look bueno here. That's a weekly chart. Take a look at the daily now. Yikes. I mean, um, this this market has just been declining, declining, and everyone's been saying you got to be an AMD. And and quite frankly, I I with that type of volume and that destructiveness in the uh, relative strength, it wouldn't surprise me to see a print back to 90, 95 zone before um, the April expiration in two weeks uh, come out. So we've got AMD. Uh, and then Micron had earnings. People are making a good, you know, like, boy, what a surprise with Micron. And it formed a daily low closed doji, a PPS cell, negative relative strength. So that's Micron. NXPI, looking at the semis, uh, that doesn't look as, as good either. NVDA is more not a semiconductor chip, but also a graphic card. They look like something's going wrong here. Volume, this is a daily chart. Let's look at the last uh, weekly analysis and say, gee, uh, relative strength, every time it rallies, it just weakens and the volume is trending lower. Look at the yellow line. So I can't get really excited about a lot of stuff. So when I say short-term up, long-term down, this is kind of the things that I'm looking at. So technology, looking at the XLK, if we take a look at technology, a lot of high PE ratio stocks in there. And in higher interest rate environment, it makes it very difficult for those stocks to really grow. That's why they're high PEs. And so I would have to say that we might be coming to an impasse and seeing a higher time frame distribution top. What happens? Market rallies. People always like to buy high and sell higher. But in a distribution top pattern, it's like you liquidate holdings on rallies. So short term, we could get some upside. And then I'm expecting maybe a new definition of sell in May and go away, possibly. And that's uh, that's what we have to contend with. So this week's newsletter, as well, it's not that rosy. There were a couple bright spots, and I'll point them out. SBUX, Starbucks. Yeah, I've had enough Starbucks today. And, uh, you know, uh, while I'm not a big fan of the relative strength was super negative, it got oversold, and it's improving, and the weekly volume popped, and we're in a weekly buy. I could look, say that if we do get a short-term dead cat bounce, Starbucks could certainly see improvement there. Let's take a look at the daily chart. So the daily chart kind of looks like, wow, yeah, here was a low, here was the relative strength, here's a prior low, new lows, and the relative strength, slight convergence. Volume looks like a very strong spike low and uh, a washout. While the last four days we didn't get any volume participation, it still to me seems like with the weekly end of week gave a decent buy, I think we have a low risk upside trade here that we can make a little bit of money on and so with starbucks and by the way howard schultz coming in as an interim boss and you know regardless of his political views and uh what he does man i saw howard um uh, uh, speak in a private function and that guy ha has come from nothing his father by the way i think he grew up in brooklyn uh new york you know what his, his father did for a living back in the day like without air conditioning and trucks, picked up when people had cloth diapers. He picked up the nasty cloth diapers and threw them in the back of the, the truck for a cleaning company uh, for baby diaper services in the summer in Brooklyn, man. That's what his dad did for a living. This guy came from nothing. I have a lot of respect for Howard Schultz. And I think if he's running the helm, that's what maybe the market sees. Howard's back, baby. And maybe we get some upside. We also saw something interesting. Starbucks got a lot of uh, exposure to China. And we saw this week a lot of China stocks like Baba, uh, Baidu. Uh, while I'm not behind them right now, uh, they're sideways. They just recovered off lows and are still in negative territory and negative trends. They recovered off the lows because China said, hey, if you guys want to examine our books, we're going to allow that. So a lot of Chinese stocks really got a lift on that. The FXI is a Chinese leveraged or not leveraged but it's a chinese etf the relative strength fuchsia means it's improving relative to the s p 500. Uh, i need more than a, a a dead cat bounce trend sideways uh in a stronger pattern before i say hey let's buy china right now after all shanghai's in a lockdown uh this could be just a a one week wonder news and as you can see the trend is clearly lower it ain't higher so what we want to see is something down uh, say a rally and then a support 
And then we want to see maybe improved volume and improved relative strength and then go with the mini trend to the upside. Something like over here, right? Trends developing because no one will buy this until you start to get a breakout. And that's the sweet spot that you want to get into. Relative strength improving, volume picking up, and there, no heat straight up. I don't see that here. But it's worthy of bringing it to your attention. All right. Next, for this week's newsletter, we um, have uh, a stock. We're already in it, which is nice. It's And we damn darn close came to getting stopped out. It's uh, VZ, Verizon. So um, in looking at the telecoms, we have um, an interesting situation. Uh, telecoms uh, are actually neutral in the month of April. Consumer staples, semiconductors are neutral. So neutral after a rally with the AMD call going down is possible. Software, computer software, airlines is neutral. Telecoms is neutral, but telecoms got beat up when they should have been strong. And this is what has caught my attention with Verizon. The relative strength is improved slowly but surely and is bright blue outperforming the market on an increase in volume. So we did come real close to getting stopped out. It didn't happen. We're in Verizon. Granted, I'm not proud of the entry. We could have done a little bit better, but um, we're in Verizon at, at 53, 58. And um, as you can see, and I'll share it with you right now, you can clearly take a gander. Um, we had that little high closed doji and the market closed, as you can see at 52.12. So we are underwater on the trade, but we're, you know, we just got in it. So this double bottom on Verizon, and if it's neutral, all right, maybe it won't break out to 60, but I mean, even it get back to 55, it's a nice trade, makes up for maybe the Walgreens debacle. Let's take a look at Walgreens, WBA. Walgreens pays a dividend. Walgreens beat top line, bottom line. Uh, they said they made a lot of money on uh, COVID testing. So, and they also had peripheral uh, services uh, and, and, and sales, but the street didn't give a rat's behind. They liquidated the crap out of it. And the reason was because, well, if COVID is deemed to maybe sell off, no one wants the vaccines, maybe they lose traffic. So if they, if they stated that the reason they beat earnings and made money was because traffic coming in for COVID testing and COVID uh, booster shots, if less people do that, then maybe they're not going to make money. I, 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 I still like the stock longer term why it pays a dividend it's on every street corner they cleaned up their books they cleaned up everything you've got the boots alliance in the uk doing better and uh from a longer term perspective the monthly uh is improving over time so again it might not be the greatest stocks and sliced bread but on a four percent dividend yield it's still not that bad so but i gotta respect the street if nobody wants to buy it, we can't be in it. And we had a stop and we're out. So we move on. Sorry about that one. Um, other trades that we had this week, uh, lots of talk on TL, uh, TLRY, Tilray. We we got out of half the position. I, I mean, sorry about this chart because it's um, been so volatile through the years. But let's just try to take a uh, a little slice of the I uh, have to change this over to a daily chart. There you go. Um, we just raised our stop. We'll, we'll play with it. Um, law in Congress needs to be passed. We'll see what happens. Uh, you can read up on the news. Uh, Tilray, it's, um, you know, if it breaks out, it breaks out. If there was ever a time for this to go up, now would be it. I mean, you're voting in Congress for two things. A, why would Tilray be a good stock to purchase because, or why are we still holding it and not taking a profit? The, uh, the bill is so that pharmaceutical companies can test and do research on THC, which means they will need to buy lots of grown pot. And this company grows the pot. So if they have the contracts, which they do with the UK government, as well as the French government to do studies, the USA getting in the act saying, hey, our European counterparts are kind of beating us in this. Uh, we're America. Let's pass a, at least regulation or, or laws that say that U.S. pharmaceutical companies can at least test for epilepsy and what the dynamics are of THC. Legally, they buy lots of pot, does well for the grower, till rate. That's my logic connection. Is that all true? It seems that that is the case. Can pharmaceutical 
companies buy from Tilray or would they buy from another grower? It all depends. But I think the the whole point is that there's a an open door for new sales and um, for for pharmaceuticals. Now, if the other regulation passes for the banking, where distributors and companies that are already out there, like Cureleaf and MedMen, where people walk in, buy pot, like Illinois, it's legal. As long as you're 21, got a pulse and money, uh, you can buy recreational pot. Um, now, I know Nancy Reagan is turning in her grave, just say no. And a lot of people say it's a gateway drug to other things. But the funny thing is that fentanyl is, well, people are doing that regardless of the pot. So uh, I think the, the moral of the story is um, if we do see so much and so many states leaning towards deregulation, let's get it on the books so that these companies that are selling pot legally can do their taxes legally, bank legally, and pay the taxes legally instead of the penalties and having to go around the banking laws. So, and, and it would then finally make sense because it's like putting a cart before the horse. Make it legal so pot companies, if you say the states can sell it then and you want to federally tax them, make it legal so that they can bank because it's still a federal crime to sell pot. And it just doesn't make sense. So let's get this. I mean, uh, I, I just can't say how silly things are in Washington, D.C. for political purposes, but um, um, I, I can't go there with the last uh, executive order that was signed making lynchings illegal. I thought lynchings were like illegal. It's called murder. I mean, I, I <laughs> you guys did hear this, right? But it's nice that they finally recognize that lynchings are illegal. I mean, who in their right mind? I mean, it's absurd. Anyway, it's a token uh, prospect to appease the base. Uh, but, you know, if we want to move forward and, and, and get together and do things that are constructive, you know, don't do things half-assed. Having pot companies all over in certain states legally being able to sell it, and yet some states know, but then the federal laws know. I mean, get it on the books one way or another. Either, And that's what I think um, needs to take place. And if it does, Tilray's going to go through the roof, up in smoke, we would hope. Uh, other positions is that Robin Hood. Um, we've got, um, and I know a lot of you guys probably say, John, you're a moron. Uh, broker dealers aren't doing that great. The reason Hood went up is for two reasons. A, this week they announced they were going to do a credit card, and then B, they were going to do more expansive pre and post market trading opportunities. Now, a guy by the name of Steve Quirk, who was one of the founding uh, creators and worked with from the originator with Thinkorswim with Tom Sosnoff. Um, Q, uh, when when TD Ameritrade bought him out, they kept Q on. Q's smart as hell, JJ's boss. He was like second in line to run things if Tim Hockey had left TD Ameritrade. TD Ameritrade then sells over to Schwab. Schwab says, hey, Q, got some ideas? You do? Hey, that's great. Oh, by the way, we got our own peeps. You got to go. Or maybe a little bit um, something like uh, Robin Hood said, hey, we need a sharp, savvy guy to help us run and develop this company. And so under Q's guidance, um, that's, the, that's the difference. And they, all of a sudden with him there, two things were announced. This is positive. Look at the volume. And it's not because they're mem stock trading. It's because they have an army of people that have dough. They do have crypto whales with them. They have an increase in potential for this stock to go up. And I look at this base and I go, it's worthy of taking a stab. We did it with a scaling approach. I struggled with this in the live trade room, as you know. I said, you know what? Let's try it. And uh, we'll see. We have a stop in there and we'll go from there. Uber. We made money with Uber. And I said, you know, Uber could go higher. Uh, as we open up our economy, the relative strengths improved, but we could see temporary sideways action or maybe a downdraft. So let's take money out of the stock and apply some of the profits to an option strategy. And that's what we did. PYPL did the same thing with PayPal. Looks like similar chart. Relative strengths outperforming. Volume is mild, but we could see an upside. And if we do, we're going to be there because we took some of the profits from the long stock and converted it. So you have trend sideways. And if it breaks out to the upside in a short term overall market upside for the month of early April, we'll be with that trade. Um, so uh, between that and then now, lastly, energy, VLO. Valero, <coughs> prior to knowing that the government was going to release SPRs, 
It still looks good on a daily chart. Valero, we have the 100, 110 uh, call spread for the June expiration. I still think that we're going to see increased driving regardless of the crude oil uh, SPRs. I don't think Russia's pulling out. I don't think Putin's making nice. And even if he does, to get things back up and operational with now how many people employed, more people making money. Yes, they're pissed because they're, most of their money that at the job is going out the door for higher cost of living, whether it be rent, energy, food. We still will grudgingly buy what we want. So I might not want to drive to Disney because I won't, but let's say I do with the grandkids. I'm still going to do it because grudgingly, and I'm going to bite my tongue because if I, if I complain too much, I got Mary going to slap me in the head saying, stop it, right? So then I get in trouble. So you just pay up and shut up. And that's what a lot of people will do. Not going to like it, but they'll do it. Then what happens three months later when they've blown their wad, they had no extra money and they say, that was not a pleasant experience. I'm not doing that anymore or we're not gonna do it for a while. What's the point I'm making? The point is that people will pay money if they have it and have people do have money. Plus, we also had a lot of people bought uh, mobile homes. Uh, people bought a lot of jet skis. People bought a lot of big toys, all-terrain vehicles and, 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 and snowmobiles and all these other pieces of equipment that go have fun when it was a COVID lockdown, right? All of that needs to be serviced, maintained, and operated by one word, fuel. So Tesla has not come out with a jet ski yet that runs on uh, a battery. I, I would think it probably not not good in the in the water too, salt water specifically. So um, we had Winnebago, WGO is uh, I believe Winnebago Industries. And you can see their sales are gonna go down. And we talked about this in the live trade room. So in the consumer discretionary sector, I mean, this could be like, who's going to buy anything for the next 10 years? And with higher energy, anyone who bought this stuff is looking to sell it too. And then HZO is the parent company, Marine Max, of both Boston Whaler and Sea Ray. This is a weekly breakdown. This is, uh, look at the volume. This looks like we got another disaster coming there. And then uh, last but not least, Polaris, PII. So Polaris held up better than anything. So bottom line is we've got uh, consumer discretionary vehicles. We've got Ford, we got GM, we got big ticket items, uh, all looking weak. This is a small company called John Deere. Relative strength looks divergent of all get up on the latest high with an equal and opposite uh, weekly pattern. Uh, am I painting a negative picture to the market? Yeah, I kind of am. And then when you combine that with JBHT, JB Hunt, with a low close doji, I mean, whoa, this looks, this is, um, I, I don't know what to say. This uh, JB Hunt Trucking Company, this was pretty much uh, last week with the truckers, the rails, all one day. Everything in transportation went straight down to hell in a handbasket. Couldn't we see a dead cat bounce? Yes. And then what happens to the longer term trend? Down. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. But on the other side of the coin, I thought Starbucks would be okay. Uh, SNAP, Snapchat, SNAP, Snapchat, Snapchat. Let's take a look at Snapchat. You know, the relative strength's improving. Got a double bottom on the charts, filled a gap, 50%. Left an island bottom down there, tried to test it, couldn't fill it all the way. Um, that showed up on my radar screen. I go, gee, why, why would it be on my radar screen? High closed doji, that's why. And with improved weekly um, PMC with the Fuchsia, and then the uptick, look at the moving average. So, I mean, if we are going to see a dead cat bounce in the market, maybe a company like Snapchat might be able to get some upside. TWTR, let's take a look at other social media names. Twitter, um, same story. I prefer Snapchat for whatever reason right now. So I've got that. So Snapchat, Starbucks, two names that might see some upside. We had FSKR in the auto uh, department, Fisker. Uh, I said Fisker, F-S-K-R, I believe. I don't know why it didn't go uh, through. Let's try it one more time. F-S-K-R, Fisker. Come on, baby. Oh, they don't want to list Fisker. All right, perfect. Uh, let's go with the switch, switch gears real quick.
Well, um, we're not going to get it up. I've got the wrong symbol. All right. So let's go with a few other names. IQV. All right. IQV. So uh, IQV Holdings. Uh, this is a $240 stock. This had a weekly high closed OG PPS. That's why it's in the newsletter. Volume looks good. Makes it hard to trade this. I would wait for the first five-day rule of the month. See if we clear the monthly pivot. Because after all, blue is below gold. Ouch. Um, and so for me, a weekly high closed doji, let's just see exactly the volume wasn't phenomenal. And so therefore, I want to kind of hold off. So I did. It is a official high closed doji looking at United Airlines. Now, cheaper energy possibly could have gotten these guys up. Uh, I would prefer an Alaskan Air. We've been talking about that in the live trade room. It needed to close and on a breakout above that 58 last conditional change in that pivot. Uh, we couldn't even do it on a daily basis, let alone a 60-minute basis. And I will share this with you right now. So a lot of times during the day in the live room, we look for confirmation of breakouts. And if a stock breaks out, at least gives a 60-minute close greater than a resistance, that's, you know, that's positive. This stock couldn't get on a 60-minute relative basis a single close over that 5880 number. I mean, it came close. But it tried and it backed off and it just it didn't do it. Now, the for Monday uh, and I won't be in the live trading room, uh, you know, maybe you could get a little uptick from a day trade. Watch that breakout. And then you got a 61 print next day. End of the month generated a monthly buy, which is interesting. Stochastics was oversold. Seasonality not on our side. So it really needs to prove itself before I start looking at buying Alaskan Air or United or any stock. But it's my job to say, hey, here's what's happening. In that space, Boeing, as you know about the, the airline, the tragic crash that people lost lives in China, um, you know, it did generate a weekly buy. I've tried Boeing too many times this year that I have to say it's broken, it ain't working. And until it does break out above monthly pivots, I ain't touching it regardless of its weekly buys. Because every time we get a weekly buy on improved volume, it just gives another week of mild follow through and then just fails. So the um, the the real litmus test is here until it gets a weekly close over a monthly pivot and gets in a monthly buy signal. I'm not touching Boeing. Don't ask me about it. I'm sorry. I lost your money and my money in this stock several times this year. We move on. Um, APA is a uh, old Apache corporation. Now just APA. Genesis still calls it Apache. Um, if if we're still producing uh, oil, this guy's going to do well. We're capped out at 40, so I'm all right with that. Range resource in natural gas. Range resource still looking good. We're in a 25-35 bull call spread. Lots of time left at, um, you know, if one wanted to say, John, not taking the most out of this that I'm going to take for a while, and if it does puke over summer, I'm going to lose my premium. I'm actually going to give it another week because of that thought. If you wanted to get out and take your money off the table on range resource with that option strategy we had on, uh, we could do that and then look for something. These are actually the January 20th of 2023 expiration, 2535 bull call spread. So if you take a look at the quarterly chart, I mean, um, you know, 2535, we're close to 35 with a lot of time. I don't think it's really going anywhere to the downside. But if you wanted to take some money off the table, that's the one you do it with. And I'll more than likely at the end of this week, when I get back from vacation to see how it trades after the first five full days, if it's at 33, 34, I'll probably get out of it anyway. So just to let you know, and then um, we'll, we'll monitor that. So I do give my approval if you're interested in taking money off the table and range resources. Uh, IBM, we have a June call. It's a very wide um, spread. And what I mean by a wide spread, it's a 145, 175. So the daily still looks good. It held its pivot levels. Blue is above gold for the next week right here. Blue. And we'll just move this. It's giving us a forecasting of what next week's uh, pivot levels. This is weekly. So it's giving us a bullish bias, blue above gold. Um, weekly, um, the monthly pivot still slightly negative, And the quarterly, it's... Uh, slightly neutral with an upside at 40, 41 ish. The monthly is still in a buy. It held its level. The volume's pretty decent. Let's take a gander here. 
This is a, a weekly bar. Seasonally speaking, from on or about March, we have a low in March 3rd, and it moves higher into May. So IBM, I would say, with a high close doji it made, with a weekly PPS buy, it's cleared its pivot. I would say we have a good shot if it breaks out of this um, descending resistance line right here, and we close greater than. This triangle measures an objective somewhere around 155. I like that. So that's IBM, and that's why we're in that call spread. Um, so we've covered Apache. We've covered range resources. IBM, now GDXJ miners. Um, GDXJ looks good. This is a strategy that we put on as an option. We hardly, you know, we paid 2 bucks, $1.90 which puts us at a break even at around 147 or 146.90 to be exact. So the market's at 48.20. This is an April 15th expiration. So if you bought the stock, you wouldn't be, you'd be taking heat once in a while as the stock, it, you know, flips and flops back and forth. And, um, you know, it closed greater than its weekly pivot. It's still giving a negative outlook. And I'll tell you a couple of things I'm not too pleased about the metals and the mining sector. The relative strength does not look good uh, a higher time frame. So let's take a gander and I'm going to use HGSI for that as well. Let's get on HGSI charts. Here we go. And let's look at, let's look at GDXJ together. All right. So the relative strengths, okay. The volume's weakening. This is a weekly outlook. Uh, it's been trying and trying and trying to break out. Uh, and and in a higher inflationary time frame in any other history, if it wasn't for maybe cryptocurrency and the Fed coming out, Jay Powell saying one thing, underselling the, the problem of inflation. Remember, transitory was his big word. Then hemming and hawing and stuttering on, on the podium when he comes out with his press conferences. But then when he sits in Congress, he says something totally different. He's uh, he's he's playing the politic game, in my humble opinion, and the Fed, he's he's. Either he knows something that we don't know, which we could guess is this is a house of cards economy built on fragile, inflated dollars, um, and they can't really do much about it. Otherwise, they're going to cause a systemic global market crash. I'm not quite sure with the Eurozone and the UK and everyone else and with the war in, going on with Russia, Ukraine, and then again with China. Uh, you know, we got to sell our debt to somebody. So with the Fed not buying the debt back and they're going to push it off on somewhere, there's a lot of issues that we've never really encountered in our financial system before. I want everyone to understand that. We have never encountered a balance sheet this high that's getting liquidated by the Federal Reserve with a tightening in interest rates in our economic financial history ever. So this is what makes trading so intriguing in these last few years in this pandemic. With the gold miners, how do you like to buy something when the relative strength is weakening and there's no volume? So let's take a look at a couple names. NEM, Newmont Mining, one of the top big names. It rallied, it broke out. Volume is not breaking out, confirming it on a daily chart. And the relative strength is weakened. So this would tell me that uh, who that nobody's really really convinced this is going up. Now the weekly chart looks better and the weekly relative strength is positive, but here we have a new high breakout. Why is the relative strength after this whole move, which is a greater move from A to B and over distance time than over here. And we can't get the relative strength to outperform greatly as it did in, in early 20. So this tells me there's something distinctly wrong with the metals and the mining. And when we take a look at the XME, which is the metal and mining ETF, you go, wait a minute, person's got a point. It broke out and it's weakening and it couldn't make a new high and the volume is downturning a little bit. And we formed a doji last week. On a daily basis, why are we making new highs? Go up, fall, go up, fall, can't go up and the relative strength's weakening. So I just wanted to point out to you, there's some issues there. So this makes it hard to say, listen, are we in a, a nice smooth time frame where the relative strength's improving and the, and the volume's going up like it was back in February? Or did maybe we overstay our welcome here? And maybe that's the case right now. So it, it either what's driving metals and mining? The fear of rampant inflation. What curtails inflation? Interest rates getting uh, aggressively spiked higher. 
And so that would quell inflationary fears. And so the inflation trade might come down. So what do we do with our position? We got two weeks left, April 14th expiration. And it's a, if we do get, you know, stay above this 48 number, we make money and uh, we're going to watch it for another week. But I'm not adding to that trade whatsoever. Lastly, SLB, Schlumberger. If we're going to service companies, then Schlumberger, Halliburton, and the oil service sector should do well. And even with the SBRs, these guys are on top of things. And I think they have some government contracts. So you would think that we would see a better improvement. And we did have a breakout with Schlumberger. The relative strength was doing all right. The volume died out. Now we have a April 14th, 42 and a half 50 strike call. I've covered this many times. Why would I even sell the 50 strike call against the 42 half? Because I got 25 cents. And on a 10 lot, that's $250 credit in my pocket. So as long as the market stays kind of, we paid $1.75, which is too expensive per se. And in this environment, we should have seen a little bit better performance. So if there's another stock that I'm willing to get out of or trade I'm willing to get out of on any rally this week, if I'm not able to do it fast enough, dump the Schlumberger and try to get at the very least on, on the Schlumberger trade, try to get $253 on a pop up. And, and it should be there theoretically if we get to around uh, 45, just throwing that out there. All right. Um, so we've covered pretty much everything on the board. Verizon, uh, Tilray, Robinhood, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, uh, you know, April 14th, Bear Fly, it's not going to work, uh, MSFT, but Microsoft, uh, if there is ever a stock that could go down in a higher rate environment, it's this one. This is the daily chart. I didn't want to cover this last because in the technology, if you do get a dead cat bounce or if this market, if the market goes higher up to like in the spite of 470s, Microsoft could lead us get back to 320. What's wrong with this picture? Market made a new high rally the other day relative to its old high on weakening volume condition. So I'd have to say that the technical condition of Microsoft, the relative strength has weakened. It's negative, gang, negative. So dead cat rally, maybe you get it. And then after that, straight down. It's not going to work by April 14th, but stranger things have happened in this world. I would say that rallies, we would probably want to continue to watch uh, Microsoft, because on a higher rate environment, these guys should suffer, especially with where their PE is. So with that said, I thank you for your time. That concludes our, our overall view of the marketplace. Short term, we could get a dead cat bounce in the in the market indices. Uh, down first, open up later. Uh, you know, it's a crazy world. This is a weekend. Well, I don't know if uh, Putin hits a nuke bomb. I don't know if he... Uh, uh, dies. I don't know if he concedes. I don't know if he gets aggressive. The market will react to that. Um, as far as Fed talkers uh, and what gets printed in the newspaper and how people's confidence is about the market with the higher jobs and inflationary outlook, that's another thing. Consumer uh, confidence levels is also something. We had no clue, by the way, uh, and, and, and the newsletter might be too thorough. There might be people complain. There's uh, some people complain, hey, I don't need everything that's in the newsletter. Let me just share the newsletter with you. Uh, and just to go over this, um, we're, in order to figure out where a market might go, kind of figure out, well, what's been going on for the week. So I just do a quick review of what's going on. But where were we for the end of the quarter? Where were we? Were, because between the end of the uh, quarter and year to date was one day. Quarter ended Thursday year to date was Friday. So you've got your year to date, your end of quarter, and what did the market do for the week? Market for the week was pretty much unchanged. So that shows there's a contraction in volatility when we didn't move much on the dial one way or another. We're still negative on the year for all the major indices. Next, technically speaking, I wanted to just share with you, what does it mean by quarterly person's bearish mode for the cues, uh, for the quarterly outlook and the monthly? And, and so I went through all of that and also the commitment of traders data from a contrarian. That's number two. Um, small specs are now short and so are the um, hedge funds. So that's kind of interesting. We are in PPS signals in a monthly sell, which I shared with you in the video. So I'm just going through a quick guide. And now for quick reference, 
What's the major support for the quarterly outlook? What's resistance? Look at the monthly resistance, 470.77. I'm calling for a potential we could get up there. And the market gets all relieved and everyone's warm and fuzzy. And then see what happens after that. Um, what sectors are usually under normal years, not pandemic and not federally induced um, you know, manipulated market environment with, with our <laughs> monetary policy at damn near zero interest rate still. Remember, we just raised the Fed funds to a quarter. We are back to where Fed funds should be fully at 3% in this economy if things are all well and healthy, okay? And every time there's some little sniffle and sneeze, whether it was Delta and Omicron, you know, oh, it's a risk to the economy, and then Russia, risk to, there's always a risk. Again. Listen, man, there's a risk walking across the street, Jerry, Jerome, Jay. Listen, do something, right? And, uh, you know, stop artificially propping up the market. Let's let capitalism work. Anyway, with that said, what's going on with the market? Aerospace, defense, not with Russia. Anyway, gold and silver, that's curious because we just addressed the uh, uh, metals and mining and bonds. TLT go down, yield goes up. We're still gonna work on buying a pullback, hopefully in TBT. Um, commodity spreads, these are carryovers, so you can see what the commodity trends are. Most all of these are over 80% probability on a 25-year average. So uh, generally speaking, you uh, these spreads have an 80% success rate over the last 25 years. That's why I post these. My comments for the week, especially major observations like the banks weakening and, and again, housing weakening and the REITs weakening, that's cause for concern as well as transportation. I go through what stocks were to buy it, the entry. Why 50-50? Because we could still see a test of some uh, or right in the open with Snapchat being a weekly high closed doji. We could still get a, a slight pullback. So I'm gonna spread it off a little bit. I give you the target of what the profit is. Try to take something off. If you get in a full position, get off of half. If you get in a half position, get out of half, right? And then the whole date, what's the seasonal, what's my expectation of when we should get filled and where we should get out? Um, this, don't ever forget to read the top. These are the weekly PPS buy and P NHD sell signal, buy signals. And these are the sell signals. Best buy, for example, JB Hunt, uh, Semiconductor, uh, and also um, Old Dominion Freightline had a big ass uh, breakdown, by the way. And then TPR, which is coach. Um, this tells you what we did last week via either email alert or actually in the newsletter. This is our current position. This is again, your reports, uh, what's coming out that's important this week. If you're gonna take time off, this is the time to take off because there's not much going on. And there's a mild earnings outlook. Just we have Tilray, which we're in a position in with a stop. Uh, and I mean, ConAgra, uh, Constellation, uh, STZ, Greenbrier, I believe it is, not much else. So. The next Fed meeting, May 3rd and 4th, they'll announce it on the 4th at 2 p.m. with another one of the Jay Powell lame press conferences as he hems and haws and says, hey, well, we'll continue to monitor. All right. Thank you for listening. And I hope you found this insightful and at least a better way to read what you need to take away from the newsletter. If you don't like commodity spreads, don't read it. But if you want quick, fast reference, print this out. Where's my reports today? What's my earnings for today? Where's the pivot support and resistance for the different time frames? all in that advisory service weekly? I hope this helped. Thank you. And I'll see you uh, back here if all goes well. And Royal Caribbean returns us to, uh, or celebrity, excuse me, we're going on celebrity. Uh, and we'll give you a, a, an insight on what the cruise line industry looks like. With that said, thank you all very much. Have a great, successful trading week. Thank you.